Let me begin before we uh, deal with the remaining biblical definitions of discipleship. Let me begin with expressing <clears throat> my fear and to warn those who will be watching uh, this teaching. In the Christian church, particularly uh, the Pentecostal church, we like to reduce things into slogans. And we like to teach something that we have not fully grasped. Discipleship uh, in, insists that what is important when we've been taught uh, is to practice something. It is out of practice <clears throat> that you know if you know something. Um, but in the, particularly today's church, any little thing that we know, we want to run, run with it. We want to be telling everyone about it. We use the word novelty. Novelty, it's something that is novel. So we want to shine by talking about it and teaching about it. Surprising people that uh, we've got knowledge that someone else does not have. I'm praying that those who are watching this and our brothers and sisters in Botswana will not rush to teach, but they will rush, rush to practice. You don't know something until you have practiced it. You only know something when you have practically experienced it. If you have not experienced something, you don't know it. So the shallowness that I was talking about yesterday comes from failure to process, to process what you have been taught. That's where it comes from. It's, a, it's when you fail to process what you have been uh, exposed to and actually practice it and see how it works in your own life. Let me give you an example. The example, the example I'm giving you shows that you don't know something until you've practiced it. Let's assume there are two people. One person is learned. He has studied agriculture. He has a PhD in agriculture. And this person, because of his knowledge of agriculture, can give you a sophisticated description of an orange. He will explain to you uh, the meaning and the importance of the peels, the cover, the skin that we peel off from an orange. This person can tell you why the orange comes in slices. He will tell you the importance of the seeds. He can give you a very sophisticated explanation of an orange. But the person has never tasted an orange. But he knows, he knows it from A to Z. But someone else uh, is not educated at all. Maybe he's going to school up to standard two. Uh, but uh, he has worked in a farm where they are growing oranges. And he has tasted all kinds of oranges. By just watching an orange, he'll tell you that orange is not sweet. 
and he watches another one, he says, this one is sweet, but he knows it by experience. Who knows the orange better? The one who has got a theoretical understanding of an orange and the one who has got a practical experience of tasting an orange. Th this thing is very, very important. That's why in Peter, uh, there's a scripture that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It does not say study and understand that the Lord is good. It says taste. It is found in Peter. Uh, where is this? That says taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, it is, is it in First Peter chapter 2? Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Also in Psalm. Psalm 34 verse 8 and in Peter 2. Let's go to Psalm 34 verse 8. Um, this matters. Discipleship is not good for someone, does not help someone who is enthusiastic, someone who is not reflective, someone who does not think about about what is studying. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Uh, I, I would have thought he would say, study and understand that the Lord is good. <clears throat> study and understand that the Lord is good. But no. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And uh, even in 1 Peter, it says the same thing. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. 1 Peter 2 and verse 3. And see what the Bible says. The Bible is... It's a very interesting book. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, no, no, now that you have tasted, now here they've tasted, they are not told that they must taste. Because he says in verse two, like newborn babies. So you can't be a newborn baby if you have not tasted Christ. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. So I want to beg you, don't rush to teach something that you have not tried out in your own life. Uh, we will be talking about the challenges of discipleship in the future. We will also be talking about uh, demands of discipleship. Uh, don't rush out uh, to begin to teach others what you yourself have not experienced. Don't do that. In Romans chapter two, Christ warns about, I mean, Paul warns about that. <clears throat> he warns the Jews who want to teach the Gentiles something that the Jews are not practicing almost the whole chapter, Romans chapter 2. Um, he says, where do we begin? Where he talks about uh, you who teach others. Have you not, uh, um, don't you, have you not practiced what you teach? Uh, where do we, begin. Bear with me now. Maybe let's begin. Uh, he says, um, verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself 
for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done, not according to what he knows. He will give to everyone according to what he has practiced. And to those who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give them eternal life. Who are persistent in doing good? Verse 7 says so. Not persistent in knowing, but persistent in doing. But those but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Uh, I want to jump that. Uh, it says, you, you tell others not to commit adultery. Let's go to verse 17. Verse 17. It says in verse 17, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law, the law is the Bible. For the Jews, the law was the books of Moses. If you rely on the law and you brag about your relationship with God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, because you are instructed, you are instructed by the law, you know the Bible, you brag about it. If you are convinced that you are a guide to the blind, you are a light to those who are in the dark, you are an instructor of the fools, you are a teacher of infants, because you have been, you have in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Yesterday I talked about, maybe the first day, the distortion of discipleship. Discipleship will be distorted if we teach others but we don't do what, what we teach others. Verse 21, then you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who hate idols, do you rob temples in order to get idols? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed. That's 24. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Can I beg you in Botswana and others who are watching this on YouTube, don't go around teaching what we're teaching you uh, without practicing it. We know these things work because we have experienced them. We are not teaching theory, we're teaching life. We have lived these things and we know that they are true. We know them by experience, we have tasted them. We have tasted them. So it is important for you not to rush, not to rush to go and teach others. Don't do that. But prove these things and see if they are working in your own life. <clears throat> okay, that's enough. Uh, I was just burdened by the need not to make discipleship a doctrine. Discipleship is not a doctrine, it's, it's, it's life. 
Uh, it's life. You don't know discipleship until you have experienced it in your own life. <clears throat> now we're, we're dealing with biblical definitions of discipleship. Uh, they say in management, in management they say, if you want to solve a problem, you must define it correctly. If you want to solve a problem, the first thing to do is to define it correctly. If you want to, to have a correct understanding of discipleship, you must define it correctly. So he said, one, it is a followership, followership. Number two, it is a process of being made, life formation, life formation, process of being made. Number three, it's yoke bearing, yoke bearing. In other words, it is proximity to Christ, it's nearness to Christ so that you can learn from him. You must be yoked with him. <clears throat> Come and take my yoke. It's proximity to Christ, closeness to Christ so that you can learn from him. By the way, what we say about Christ, we also say about human disciples. Those who are very far from the person who is discipling them don't learn much. People who grow, grow very fast are those who are close to their human disciple. Proximity or closeness to your disciple. Proximity or closeness to Christ and also to your human disciple. It's when you are yoked together, <clears throat> you are close. That's number three. Number four, it is to it is imitation. Uh, you imitate the life of Christ or you copy the life of Christ. It's imitation. You imitate the life of Christ. You imitate the life of your disciple. That's why a person discipling other people must make sure that their life, are, their life are correct. Because if your life is wrong, a disciple will always copy your life, copy your life, whether it is wrong or right. They will copy. People copy the life of the person they follow. <clears throat> so it is important that it is correct. Number six, we said it is life bearing light, sorry, it is light bearing. You, 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 you bear the light of Christ, who is the light of the world. And then we said it is also life bearing. Christ is life and Christ dwells in us richly. Christ in you the hope of glory, so he is our life. We said so, Christ is our life, and now we bear him, we reflect him. And then yesterday we ended by saying, it is a process of conformity to the image of Christ. We are being changed, we are being changed to the image of Christ. And we ended yesterday by reading a scripture that says, we are transformed from one level of glory to the other and we reflect it. <clears throat> now we're beginning then with number eight. Um, discipleship is friendship with Jesus. I'm going, to I'm going to explain that. 
It is friendship with Jesus. That is number eight. I remember there's a song we used to sing. Sometimes you sing things you don't fully understand. It says, friendship with Jesus, fellowship divine. Oh, what blessed sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. It's friendship with Jesus. Uh, in discipleship, you can't, you can't learn much from someone you are not friendly with. That's why there's a difference between being a pastor of a church and being a discipler of lives. Because when you're a pastor of a church, somehow, for a wrong reason, uh, people think that pastors are people that you, you, must not over, you must not be overly used to. You can't joke with a pastor. You must go reverently to church and the pastor goes to the pulpit, the man of God, and he preaches. And you learn, you must say, Amen, Amen. And then the pastor is happy. Then he greets at the door. He says, we'll meet next week. Uh, but in discipleship, in order for you to learn, you must be close, you must be friends. To an extent that you can share jokes, you can laugh, uh, there's a relationship. That's very important. It's friendship. First of all, though, it is friendship with Jesus because you are yoked with him, isn't it? You are yoked with him. It's amazing that there are so many scriptures that talk about friendship. I, I was amazed to notice that Christ in many places, refers to his disciples as friends. Friends. Let's see that in John chapter 15. He calls them friends. And they were close, they were friends. They were friends. To an extent that when Peter wanted to see him, he says, Jesus, can I see you outside? And Christ goes outside and Peter says to him, don't ever say that thing again. You hear me? Don't talk about death. We don't want a leader who's going to die. So you could not have said that if they were not close. And he says in 15, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. Do you know, to me, even this idea of disciple, disciple, I think there's something wrong because it creates class differentiation. You are a discipler. You are a disciple. I'm a discipler. It's like you're a student. I'm a lecturer. Okay. So it creates that class distinction. Christ calls friends. I've called you friends. It's just that I don't know what other word we could use. I don't like the word discipler. I like the word friend. We are friends. I'm a friend of Christ. I've learned a lot about Christ. I've learned, I've learned Christ. And you are my friend. I'm teaching about Christ whom I know. I'm also introducing to my friend, Christ. May I repeat that? I am a friend of Christ. <clears throat> I've been a friend of Christ for many years. And I've learned a lot uh, from Christ. I've learned Christ. Now you become my friend. As my friend, I teach you all I know about Christ. And I also introduce you to Christ so that you can learn directly from him. It's friendship. 
I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made it known to you. That's important, friendship. <clears throat> so if you want to be a friend of Jesus, what must you do? You must be a disciple. It's simple. If you want to learn more about Christ, you must be a disciple. Even uh, Abraham was called a friend, a friend of God. Abraham was a disciple, followed God. And in James chapter 2.23, James 2.23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. If even God, God the Father, calls uh, those that follow him, friends. How should we call those who follow us? They are friends. It's friendship. So when you've got a friend, you are free with a friend. You can tell a friend things you cannot tell anyone else <clears throat> because that person is a friend. So when you go to Christ and you've got this idea that he's a friend, you are free. You can tell Christ, hey, Lord, I prayed to you and I thought you were going to answer me and you didn't answer me. Friend, I was disappointed when you didn't answer me. Uh, but, but I'm all right now. But but when I, I expected an answer and it did not answer me, I was disappointed. You can speak freely because you're speaking to a friend, freely. Do you remember <clears throat> the Bible speaks of John as a person who leaned on Jesus' chest? Do you remember that? There's a verse that says so, that he leaned on Jesus' chest. Uh, very interesting uh, that he could lean on the chest of Jesus. It was our friends. C can you lean on the chest of your past? I'm asking you. How many of you have leaned on the chest of your own past? Hmm? So discipleship is, is friendship, is closeness. We talked about proximity, it gives you proximity, it's closeness. Uh, where is that verse that talks about him leaning? Uh, it's John 21 verse 20. Yes, John 21 verse 20. It says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, you see the issue of love, was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? That's friendship, that's closeness. If you want to be a friend of Jesus, become a disciple. Become a disciple. Become a disciple. Matthew 26. Uh, 26 and verse 50. Matthew 26 and verse 50. And uh, you who are discipling people, be friendly with those you are discipling. When you are friendly with those you are discipling, they'll tell you everything. There's nothing they will not tell you. They will not hide anything from you. Uh, 26 and verse 50, 
he says, Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. And he calls Judas Iscariot friend, because Judas Iscariot was a disciple. He says, friend, do what you came to do. He calls him friend still, because he was a disciple. So when you are a disciple, you are a friend of Christ. You are a friend of Christ. Um, you are a friend of Christ. That's very, very important for you to note that. Now, I want to show you something else then. I want to show you, you remember I told you that when you've been a disciple for a long time, you become a long time friend of Christ, okay? A long time friend of Christ. And someone else is becoming a disciple right now. He has not yet developed friendship with Christ. <clears throat> now you tell him about, about Christ you know from being a friend of Christ. But you also introduce them to Christ. John chapter 3 and 29. John chapter 3 and 29. <clears throat> John 3, 29. It says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Who is the bride? Anyone who becomes a Christian becomes a bride of Christ. And all of us collectively, are co the church is the bride. So everyone we introduce to Christ do not belong to us. They belong to Christ. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends to the bridegroom, who are we? We are friends who attend to the bridegroom, waits and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine, and it is now complete. So John the Baptist calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. No the friend of the bride, <clears throat> okay, bridegroom. And who are we? We are friends of Christ. We are friends of Christ. And we're introducing um, people to our friend. We introduce people to our friend. Let me show you something else, John chapter 11. There were three people who were disciples of Christ, Mary, Mary and Martha. <clears throat> Mary and Martha. Verse one. Now a man Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister. This Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick was the same who poured perfume <clears throat> on the Lord and wiped his feet with his hair. Then verse three, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love, <laughs> the one you love, the one you love is sick. Verse 11, I want to see verse 11. The verse I wanted to quote is 11, really. It says, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He does not say, oh, my disciple, <clears throat> our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Friendship, <clears throat> it's friendship. Now, what surprised me was that Paul also called those that he was discipling 
friends. Let me show you a few scriptures. He called those whom he was discipling friends. Colossians chapter 4, 14. This is Paul calling those he was discipling friends. Colossians chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse 14. He says there, Our dear friend, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas sends greetings. Paul does not even say friend, he says our dear friend. And Paul discipled Luke. They traveled together in his missionary journeys and he calls him my dear friend. You go to Philemon, Philemon, Philemon has got one chapter, um, chapter one and verse one. <clears throat> Philemon one one. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend. He calls Philemon, my dear friend my dear friend. And he was discipling uh, Philemon, but he, he calls him my dear friend. You go to Romans 16, Romans chapter 16, verse five. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my friend, a penitus, who was the first convert to Christ. Oh, in the province of Asia. So he preached there. This man became the convert of Paul. He discipled him. Now he calls him my dear friend. You go to verse 9. Yeah, you go to verse 9. <clears throat> Great Ubenas our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend, Stachis. My dear friend, Stachis. You go to verse 12. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my friend, Persis, Another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Another woman who has worked very hard is a friend of our brother Paul. So discipleship is, discipleship is friendship. Friendship. If you, if you are too formal in discipleship, you are too formal, you are officious. You can't, you, you can't teach discipleship. No, you can't, you must be friendly. But more importantly then, discipleship is friendship between the one who is discipling you and you who are being discipled. But even more importantly, uh, it's friendship between you and Christ. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, the hymn writer says, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. If you want to become a friend of Jesus, what must you do? You must become a disciple. That was number eight. Number nine. Discipleship is brotherhood, is brotherhood. Uh, the relationship between a disciple and a, a disciple and a discipler, I don't like the word disciple, but I'll use it, uh, between a, 
the, the helper of life. We are brothers, it's brotherhood. Even with Christ, <clears throat> once you become a disciple, you become a relative of Jesus. You become a brother of Jesus. Please don't misunderstand me, but this is true. It's only disciples who are, who are, who are brothers of Christ, truly. Honestly. Let's turn to Matthew uh, chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 46 to 50. Matthew chapter 12, 46 to 50. It says there, it's a very interesting chapter. It's dramatic. Uh, in verse 46, it says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers, these now are his blood relatives, his mother and brothers, stood outside <clears throat> waiting to speak to Jesus. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. Verse 48, he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Verse 49, pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Verse 49 is important. Here are my mother and my brothers. When you're a disciple, <clears throat> you become a brother to Jesus. You become a brother to Jesus. I'll show you two other verses. Two other verses. Matthew 25 and verse 40. 25 and verse 40. And it says, the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of these list of these, my brothers of mine. You did it for me. This is Christ saying that if you did it for one of these, my brothers, you've done it for me. <clears throat> so Jesus regards not Christians, but disciples. He regards them as his brothers, his brothers, his brothers. Do you remember what he said after resurrection? Let's go to Matthew 28 and verse 10. That's the last scripture I'm going to quote <clears throat> on Christ. The Bible talks about the women who went to the grave on the resurrection. Let's begin from eight on the resurrection morning. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Verse nine, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshiped him. Jesus said to them, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers. He's talking about disciples. He's talking about disciples. He calls them brothers, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, go to Galilee. They will see me there. There they will see me. He calls them even after resurrection, the resurrected and glorious Christ 
who called his disciples before he was resurrected, he called them brothers. Even after resurrection, <clears throat> he called them brothers. Very important. Now what I did, and it really astounded me, I looked at Paul in many, 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 many places. Paul called those that he worked with brothers. Let me show you Paul now. Paul calling those that he discipled, he calls them brothers. He calls them brothers. But these are the people he discipled. Let's go to, uh, is it five? Philippians 2.25. I hope I have quoted the scripture correctly. Philippians 2.25. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother. Paul calls Epaphroditus, whom he was discipling, he calls him my brother. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. <clears throat> he calls Epaphroditus, he calls him my brother. Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. Colossians 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. But you know that the, re the relationship between Timothy and Paul was that of a disciple and a discipler. But it does not say, and Timothy, my disciple. It does not say, and Timothy, my disciple. It says, and Timothy, my brother, our brother. Colossians 1 and verse 1. We go to Colossians 4. And Colossians chapter 4. And verse 7 and 9. I think that will be enough. There are many, many scriptures I could refer you to. Uh, Colossians 4, verse 7, <coughs> Paul says, Tychicus, no, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother. He is a dear brother a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. But he begins by saying he's a brother, he's a dear brother. And in verse nine, he's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. Dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. <clears throat> Christ, Call those he was discipling brothers. Paul called those he was discipling brothers. So discipleship uh, creates a company of brothers. It creates a company of brothers. That's what discipleship does. And you also become a brother to Jesus when you are a disciple. I was surprised by Paul. Many, many places, he does not call those he was discipling my disciple. He calls them my brother. <clears throat> so if you want to become a true brother, a true brother to Jesus, 
uh, who will be slowly becoming like Jesus. He must become a disciple. He must become a disciple. Then he will become a friend of Jesus <clears throat> and then he will become a brother of Jesus. Number 10, <clears throat> we are defining, we are giving biblical definitions of discipleship. Number 10, a disciple is referred to, is referred to, to uh, in Acts as the people of the way, the people of the way. <clears throat> you will understand it because Christ says in John 14 verse six, I am the way with capital W. I am the way, the truth and life. I am the way. That's what it says in Let's go to John, it's 14 verse six. It's a scripture you know very well. Jesus answered, I am the way. <clears throat> the way to whom? The way to God, the Father. Because later on it says, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way to the Father. I am not one of the many ways to the Father. That's why you use the article the. I am the only way to the Father. I am the way to the Father. Okay, I am the way. Now those who gave uh, their lives to Christ, I don't know how it happened but they were known as the people of the way. <clears throat> I think it was known that Christ had said, I am the way, the truth, and uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, others then called disciples the people of the way. <clears throat> Acts 9 verses one and two. Acts 9, Acts 9, 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belong to the way, and it's capital let, who belong to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So they were known as the people who belonged to the way. <clears throat> who is the way? Christ. Christ is the way, and they were known as the people who belong to the way. Chapter 19 of Acts, 19 uh, of Acts, and uh, verse, is it, um, Verse 9, 19 verse 9. <clears throat> but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly malign the way. So Paul left them. And he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. 20, verse 23, <clears throat> still in chapter 19. About that time, there arose a great disturbance 
about the way, the way. 22 verse four, 22 and verse four. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. <clears throat> and I know that the people Paul <clears throat> persecuted were Christians. Now they are known as the people of the way. It's a highway. Discipleship is a unique way. You have, you have, you have walked in many ways but you have not walked in the way until you become a disciple. You only walk in the way when you become a disciple. Isaiah 35 <clears throat> is the last scripture we'll quote. Isaiah 35. Uh, did I say 35? Yes, eight to 10. <clears throat> Thirty-five, eight to ten. It says, and a highway will be there. It will be called, again with capital W, the way of holiness. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way, capital letter. Wicked fools <clears throat> will not go about on it. This it is enough. So it's a highway. It's not a low way of sin and compromise. It's called, it is the way of, Russia, of holiness. When you become a disciple, you don't live a cheap life. You are not a cheap Christian who is a Christian by name. No, it's elevated. Discipleship elevates you spiritually. It's a highway. It's not a low way of compromise and uh, hypocrisy and, uh, and uh, backsliding. No, it's a highway. It will be called the way of holiness. Discipleship is going to help you to be holy. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way, that way. Wicked fools. Oh, we don't find wicked people in discipleship. It helps you. It reads your wickedness. Will not go about on it. It is the way of holiness. Hallelujah, the way of holiness. So when you have come to discipleship, you have come to the way, the way. Until you experience discipleship, you will not know that there's nothing like discipleship, really, honestly, honestly. Number 11, we said we we're going to talk about 12 things. Number 11, discipleship is apprenticeship. That's number 11. Discipleship is apprenticeship. Okay? It is apprenticeship. What is apprenticeship? Uh, apprenticeship when you study anything at the university, it's particularly known in motor mechanics, but it applies to every field. <clears throat> when you study motor mechanics, you 
study about an engine and about cars, how to fix cars, first of all, you study theory. Even those who do electrical engineering, you study theory and then you don't graduate until you go out for a year to go and now study practically what I've studied maybe for two years uh, theoretically. And that practical study is known as apprenticeship. Okay, practical study. Uh, is called um, is called apprenticeship, and or some call internship. Internship. Doctors don't uh, graduate until they go to the ward. And uh, and 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 actually attend to patients. And uh, they, they do classes in class and they pass. Then they must go to the ward and then take a test and pass that practical. Even if they pass the theory, they will not pass the course. <clears throat> Internship. I know a young lady who was doing electro electrical engineering, she had to do internship practice. What am I saying? I'm saying that unlike anything else that you know, the subship is going to insist that you practice what you're learning. We talked about it before. You practice what you're learning. And there's someone, just like in motor mechanics, there's someone who's been a motor mechanic for a long time. And he has been changing engines and fixing gearboxes and uh, changing starters. He knows uh, this work as the back of his hand. <clears throat> you had a student who are studying motor mechanics. You are taught by this man who has learned uh, motor mechanics by doing, not by theory, by doing, by doing. So you learn discipleship by doing. Uh, Philippians 4 verse 9. Philippians 4 and verse 9. You learn by doing. This is Paul who disciples people. Is speaking to his disciples, 4 verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Put it into practice. So it is as though he's the one teaching <clears throat> the one who is in apprenticeship. Uh, they are learning. They are hearing what is teaching. They are also seeing visually how he lives. He says, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. There's a scripture I want whether Zandile will help me with it. Let's look for it together. It is in Thessalonians, I think. He says, Paul says, you know how we've lived amongst you. That's what he says. You know how we've lived amongst you, something like that. Uh, you know how we've lived amongst you. So he has practiced the practice. Uh, you, you know how we've lived among you. And he says, now we wanted to, we were doing this thing deliberately so that 
uh, you may learn from watching us in Thessalonians, is it one five? I'm not sure, let me check that. Yes, it is one five. It is one five. First Thessalonians one verse five. <clears throat> Let's read it. <clears throat> First Thessalonians one and verse five. Okay. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to show you something here which is important. He says in verse four, for we know brothers loved by God that he, he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Oh, I like that. You know how we lived among you for your sake. What is saying? You know how we visualized discipleship. You know how we visually demonstrated discipleship. That's why when you're discipling people, they must sometimes come to your house because when you are behind the pulpit and you speak behind the pulpit, you are one person, but they told me another person. They must know you in your home environment. You must go and live with them. You must go and camp with disciples in a close environment. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Now, do you see verse six now? You became imitators. That's discipleship. You washed our lives. We didn't hide anything. We were ourselves. We were natural. You saw us. Huh? And then you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe sufferings, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And now verse seven now, they are also now modeling this life now to others. And so you also became a model to all the believers in Macedonia, practical, practical. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Okay. So discipleship is modeling of life. It's modeling of life. It's practice. You, you, you watch me and you see how I live and you emulate me. There are many other scriptures. Maybe I'll call the last one second. Uh, Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, is practical. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Please follow, follow what I'm reading here in 2 Thessalonians because you're going to see something. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it says um, in verse 6, in the name of of the Lord Jesus, we command you brothers to keep away from every brother who is idle. What does that mean, who is lazy? Who is lazy, who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Verse seven, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. It's practical. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food 
without paying for it. We worked and we bought food. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not become, we would not be a burden to any one of you. Verse nine now. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. It's practical. We could have been idle and wanted you to be giving us money and collecting, collecting donations. No, we worked. Even though we were entitled to it, but we worked and we earned money and we supported ourselves. Why did we do it? We, do, we did it so that we can show you practically how to become a disciple who does not go around begging. He says so. So discipleship is practical. It's practical learning. It is modeling of life. Now the last biblical definition of discipleship. <clears throat> discipleship is How shall I put it? It's a program that prepares people for their inheritance. That's the last one. Discipleship is a program that prepares a people for their inheritance. For their inheritance. Romans 8. Uh, verses 15 to 17, Romans 8, 15 to 17, uh, says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Verse 17 is important. And if we are children, then we are heirs. We are heirs. We are heirs of God. And we are called heirs with Christ. So the Bible says, once you become a Christian, you become an heir. Now we then learned, you will remember, that we learned something from Galatians. Do you remember? What are you told about Galatians 4, verses 1 and 2? But what I'm saying to you is that as long as the heir is a child, is a child, he is not different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees. These are the people who disciple others, guardians and trustees, until the time set by his father. You know that when you write a will, you say, and this child will get a will at the age of 18 or 21 or 22. You set it in your will. Okay. This child must get this will at 21 or 22. In the meanwhile, I put a trust to, for their education. But now they are trained so that when they are 21, they will know what to do with the will. So discipleship trains you in what to do with all that God has deposited in you. Please note this very carefully. God has given you, God has given you gifts. 
natural gifts, you are intelligent, that's a natural gift. Ability to sing, that's a, a talent. Eloquence, that's a talent. Then you've got gifts that you get after you become a Christian. All those, we call them divine endowments. Divine endowments. God has given you gifts. But you will not know how to deal with them unless you're discipled. If you're eloquent and you're not discipled, you're going to start a church. It's going to become a big church. Big church. But you are going to do a, a mess in that church because you're not discipled. You are gifted. Uh, that's your inheritance. But you don't know how to do with it. God gives a gift of healing. And you heal, you become popular. You pick a tent, people tent, and you've got a big following. Then you sleep with the girls, the women that uh, come to that tent. It's because you're not discipled. It's because you're not discipled. You don't know how to treat your inheritance. So when you become a disciple, you don't rush to go and do ministry. You don't rush. You wait, you are discipled, you are groomed, you are helped. And then after some time, then God says, release him. Then I released to go and do good God's work. And the gifts that God has given you have been harnessed, have been refined, they have been sharpened. Now you can go and work. So discipleship is a school where you are prepared for your inheritance. We see this in the book of Ruth. Naomi was, a, was one that was used by God to disciple Ruth. And Ruth was discipled in order to get married to, uh, what is this man now? in the book of Ruth, um, in, uh, who was the great grandfather of David. Let's go to Ruth. Uh, why do I forget this man's name? Uh, in the book of Ruth, Boaz. So he had to get married to Boaz, and Boaz was the great grandfather of David. Uh, and uh, Jesse, if you, uh, Jesse was the father of David, but you know that when we talk about Christ, the ascensory of Christ, what we call the genealogy of Christ, is traced to Ruth. That was her inheritance. And she was a Moabite. She became a Christian and Naomi trained her and even guided her in getting married to Boaz and ushered her into her inheritance. Another example of discipleship ushering someone to, to, his, to her inheritance is Mordecai and Esther. Esther was an orphan and was raised by Mordecai but the inheritance of Esther was to become a queen. Uh, Esther had to become a queen. And then uh, Mordecai discipled, taught, uh, guided Esther until she became a queen. That was her inheritance. That was her inheritance. Another example is Elijah and Elisha. <clears throat> Before this time, Elisha was a businessman running an agricultural business, big business. And he didn't think he was a prophet, but God knew he was a prophet. So he sent Elijah <clears throat> to go and um, guide uh, Elisha to become a prophet. 
And he discipled him for 18 years. And then when he was to leave, he, he left his mantle with Elisha. So discipleship must guide you to what you are meant to be. Discipleship must guide you to what you are meant to be and help you to do well when you have finally become what you were meant to be. Hey, these are deep things. I pray God will grant you understanding. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're giving biblical definitions of discipleship. We said discipleship is friendship with Jesus. Discipleship creates is brotherhood between the one discipling someone and the one being discipled. We said number three, disciples are people of the way of holiness, the way of righteousness, people of the way. Then we said discipleship is apprenticeship. And then we said discipleship prepares you for what heavens knew before you were born, you were to become. And discipleship helps you to become that. May you all really become disciples. May discipleship groom you. May discipleship prune you. May discipleship refine you. Even more importantly, may discipleship lead you to your inheritance. God bless you. <clears throat> we'll meet next time when we talk again about discipleship. The Lord be with you. Bless you. Thank you.